Eleven o'clock. Okay, so no uh, constraints <laughs> this time, <laughs> but uh, now we have the paper by uh, Bishnu Gupta on employer opportunism and labor supply, evident from Assam's tea plantations in the 19th century. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be in Moscow and in this conference. Uh, my paper is jointly uh, written with Anand Swami at Williams College, uh, and it's on the tea plantations in, uh, in India. I'm going to start with an old folk tune from Bengal where a father is talking to the daughter, Mini, to uh, ask her to travel to Assam, to the land of the green plantations, and saying that back at home there's a lot of misery. The song then, of course, continues, and it go talks about the exploitation of the sahib, which is the owner of the plantation, the exploitation of the sardar, the labor recruiter, and the and, and another uh, labor recruiter uh, for bringing them to Assam under false pretenses. So all these characters are going to show up in my presentation. Um, and I'm going to tell you a story about how Assam tea became a global commodity in the late 19th century. So the story of Assam tea begins with this coercive labor institution. There are uh, many labor markets in history where, uh, which involve coercion from serfdom and slavery to indentured labor contracts. And basically, you see two different views in this literature. One is that labor scarcity led to coercive institutions and eventually to wage suppression. And this literature involved Domar in 1970, Naidu and Yuchtman in uh, uh, talking about the British masters and servants' law in uh, in in the England in uh, this uh, in the AER in 2013, and then there is Avner and Christian Dippel's paper on the West Indies, which is in a similar vein. There's a different literature which sees uh, a, a coercive labor institution such as indentured contracts as an efficient institution. It sees it as efficient in the sense that the cost of migration is high and the workers cannot undertake this cost. And therefore, the employer pays the cost uh, upfront and, the, and has to tie the worker to, uh, to the contract for uh, a limited period of time. And therefore, uh, you know, it is coercive, but it, it leads to some kind of an efficient outcome for both parties. The tea plantations in, uh, in Assam is uh, one such institution of labor indenture. Um, the reason it is a special one is that it involved two different types of contracts. One is a standard contract. So even if you believe that you know, indenture was a sort of efficient system, uh, there was a second type of contract which involved a, a, a higher degree of coercion. And we are going to distinguish between these two types of contracts to see whether the labor market outcomes differed. So one is, did a, uh, did a more harsh system of coercion lead to lower wages? And the second point that we are going to talk about is that did a harsh system discourage migration so that the workers would only migrate uh, when conditions at home were very bad? So this, is, this picture is of a tea plantation in Assam, uh, the rolling hills of Assam. It's mainly female workers plucking tea. And I'm now going to show you a picture of the tea plant, which is quite important in the discussion, because this is a, uh, the way the tea is harvested is to pull the leaves from the top of the, of the plant. Uh, so when you, when you start pulling down le plucking leaves from lower down, it's, it leads to coarser tea. So what happens is that when prices rise, there can be a very short-run response to that rise in prices by plucking coarse and increasing the supply of tea. So what I'm suggesting is 
that labor, demand for labor can actually uh, respond very quickly to a uh, change in price of tea. So what is the setting? The setting is uh, that this land that I showed you was basically uh, unoccupied. It was mainly forests. And uh, the colonial government uh, gave land grants to British companies to develop tea plantations. This region had very little uh, settlement, so labor had to be brought from outside the region. Most of the workers came from the poorest parts of India. They involved a lot of tribal regions in India. Uh, and I'll show you on a map where they were. The special feature of this migration uh, flow was that uh, many of the m workers migrated as families. And the share of women in this migration flow was nearly 50%. So the, the, the workforce which harvested tea was always female. And the, uh, and the activities were very gendered. Women were involved in the harvesting of tea and men in the processing and, uh, you know, uh, and creating the land for cultivation. This is a, a map of India. As you can see on the, on the, on the right hand side there is the Assam Valley. Um, that's where all the plantations were. The labor were brought from this region of India, uh, Bengal, Bihar, and then going to this region as well. The distance was something like 500 miles to more. So the cost of migration was pretty high in the days when the railway lines were still not laid out uh, as they are today. So this is, a, this is the, the map of Assam. Um, there are two valleys here. The valley on top is the Brahmaputra Valley. I'm going to call it the B Valley. And then this is the Surma Valley or the S Valley. Uh, the train line went somewhere here, and then the workers would just board, board a steamer or, and, and go along the river. The railway line came almost up all the way up to the Surma Valley, and the workers would travel by train and, uh, and then go by little boats if necessary to the plantations. So the distance was a crucial factor in terms of uh, this migration uh, channel. So why indenture? Given the, the distance involved, the cost of migration was high. It often, it, it typically involved uh, 12, uh, 11 to 12 months of wages for the workers. And, uh, and this the workers were unable to pay up front. So the employers therefore had a contractual problem. If they paid this cost up front and brought the workers to the plantations, some other planter could steal their worker or entice their worker away, or the workers could run away to a different plantation for a slightly higher wage. And here is a quotation from one of the managers uh, uh, working in the tea plantations at the time, saying that uh, I got a bad name because I stole other people's workers. But this I had to do because uh, I had to produce more tea. This is another one basically talking about the same kind of uh, problem the planters faced of enticement. So the response was to have an indentured contract which was enforceable by law. So the first contract was the Workmen's Breach of uh, Contract Act modeled on the British Master and Servant Law, which came, came, uh, which was, uh, which came into being in uh, 1859. The workers were tied to the plantation for three years, and if they broke the contract, they could be arrested, produced before a, a, a law court, and either put to prison or uh, brought, taken back to the same plantation. This the planters didn't like. They argued that the plantations, uh, you know, it was very difficult to arrest workers. They ran away, they hid in the jungles, and therefore the rate of arrest was quite low. And the planters needed a better way of arresting the workers who ran away. So what the, uh, the, the, the tea planters lobbied the British state for a period of several years and got various uh, improvements in this law. A new law came into being which was known as the Special Act in 1882. Under this act, an individual planter could simply go and arrest a worker running away 
So the, the planter would have men waiting at the ship, uh, at the river, ghat, or, uh, or on the road where they could pick up any worker, you know, seen to be uh, uh, deserting. And then this worker would be brought back to the plantation, beaten up, and, or punished, or produced at, at a law court, and imprisoned. So this amazing, uh, you know, astonishing right the planters got was obviously open to misuse, and it was. Uh, and this is what we are going to try to look at, is this harsh contract, how did it impact on labor migration flows? I just want to say two things. How, how did recruitment take place? Uh, recruitment took place by two methods. One in which the local, uh, the planter sent a local, uh, an employee back to his village to recruit from the community. And the second channel was to use labor contractors from the city of Calcutta who would go to various places and recruit new workers. So this gave rise to the workers' problem that the plant, the, the special act became notorious for the ill-treatment of the workers. You can read that, that quote which is there from, again, from a planter, the planter's diary. Uh, and it sort of gives you an idea of what sort of uh, punishment and what sort of uh, coercive methods were used. So if the planter had a bad reputation, the whatever promise the planter made of a wage or the recruiter made of, of a wage was not credible to a potential migrant. So the implication of the special act was that the, mig the migrants would go only if conditions at home were very bad. So the push factors encouraged migration, but the pull factors did not. And that's the, that's the difference we want to, uh, to look at and empirically see whether we find any effects of this. So the contemporary policymakers at this time were really concerned about the reputation of the Special Act. Uh, the government instituted several inquiries and argued that such a harsh act actually did affect migration adversely. Uh, this is also the conclusion of the historians, but this is basically for the first time that a data set is being put to, to test these uh, various uh, uh, conclusions. So what, am I go what are we going to do for our uh, empirical exercise? We are going to distinguish between the two types of contracts. We are going to distinguish between the high coercion and the low coercion levels. The special act is going to be called act labor. Workers recruited on the special act will be act laborers in the empirical exercise. And anybody recruited under the standard uh, indenture would be known as, uh, would be uh, called the non-act uh, uh, workers. So the first hypothesis is to test for labor coercion uh, in terms of wage suppression. Do we see wages lower amongst the act workers? And do we see that they, uh, do we see any response at all in terms of demand shocks? The second hypothesis is that act workers were more sticky to respond to demand shocks and, uh, compared to non-act workers. So we would not see act workers migrating to Assam when tea prices were high. Uh, and a, a second step to look at this would be to distinguish between workers going under the, through the community channel of recruitment and workers going uh, through a market channel of recruitment. Do we find any difference in the two types of labor flows? So the data we have is not at the le individual level or at the plantation level. The data is at the level of the districts, and there are seven districts in Assam, uh, five in the Brahmaputra Valley right in, uh, in the north, and two districts in the Surma Valley. We have information on labor flows and wage earnings at the district level for the Brahmaputra Valley, and for Surma Valley, we only have information on labor flows. Uh, uh, at the moment, we are trying to get the wage data. And we look at the, the, the migration flows between the years 1883 and 1900. So both Brahmaputra Valley and Surma Valley started with using act labor, which is this harsher contract. But then we see that in Surma Valley, this, the share of the act labor declined very fast. 
One reason for that, that Surma Valley becomes much more, much better connected to, uh, uh, to, to, the, to the railways and, the, and the, the steamers are introduced on the, on, the, uh, on the river. So it's easy to get workers in Surma Valley than take them to the, the, the Brahmaputra Valley. So this is the share of Special Act workers in uh, Brahmaputra Valley. You can see that they, it, sort of, it's, it, it stays pretty much the same over this period. And this is uh, uh, Surma Valley where they decline, uh, it declines very fast uh, over this period. The other thing I wa want to point out that in terms of enticement, two things matter. One is how expensive it is to get a new worker. But the second thing that matters is is there a social sanction for this enticement? Now, these British planters, they socialized in clubs. Uh, they socialized together. They went to the same clubs and same social uh, networks. So if the plantations were located close together, they were less likely to incur this, this cost of uh, uh, social sanction. So this is, these are the tea plantations in Assam. Uh, you can see that they are quite far apart. And this is the Surma Valley. And you can see all the plantations are pretty close together. So if workers were enticed away, then it was much easier to spot who was doing this. This is, the, this is, a, this is just a very quick comparison of the monthly real wages in, in the recruitment regions and the receiving regions. And you can see that the, the plantations did have higher monthly wages. So I'm going to uh, take you through our, uh, the empirical exercise. Our main dependent variable is labor flows by the type of contract. Uh, and the explanatory variables uh, that matter are uh, the T price shocks. So we have uh, uh, T prices averaged over two years. Um, that's the pull factor. And the push factor is the nominal wage of labor uh, and, and the price index of mainly food, so a con uh, uh, an indicator of the cost of, con uh, cost of living. And then we have controls whether the district has, has railway lines, uh, district dummies, and a time trend. So that's the price change change over this period. You can see that over, it, it is broadly declining over time, but then there are large fluctuations. And this is the price index for, uh, for, uh, for food. How much time do I have? How much time do I have? Five minutes. Okay. So if you look at uh, labor flows in the Brahmaputra Valley, you can see that non-act labor is actually a small part of this flow. Most of the workers go to the Brahmaputra Valley either as recruited by the Sardars or as recruited by the contractors. So the, 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 the largest labor flows to the Brahmaputra Valley are uh, under the act. When we come to the Surma Valley, it's, the, uh, it, it's, it's different as I've shown you. It's the uh, non-act labor inflow, which is the most important one. So the first uh, uh, empirical exercise is to see whether the teeth price shocks lead to any effect on the earnings. Now, these are not wages. These are earnings of the workers at the level of the district. And we, dis dis uh, and, uh, we disaggregate this by four categories, the act women, act men, non-act women, and non-act men. And you can see that there is no evidence of wage suppression in this data. What we find is that the wages of act women respond quite strongly to uh, rise in tea prices. Uh, and there's also some effect on, on the wages of, uh, on the earnings of men. So we don't actually find evidence of wage suppression, suppression in the data we have at the moment. The second, uh, uh, the second, uh, actually let me go back here. The, the second and the main, uh, the main empirical exercise is to see whether uh, the reputation of the act actually affects labor flows to demand shock. And this indeed is the case. Look, if you look at the first two columns, uh, non-act labor responds very strongly to any, any price shock. 
And this effect is much bigger in the Surma Valley uh, compared to the Brahmaputra Valley. When you go to act labor, we don't find any response at all. And that's sort of, you know, not surprising because that's what we've been arguing so far, that the reputation had big consequences for labor flows. Now, we get to the more interesting bit. We disentangle the act labor migration by contractor imports and the community channel uh, imports. So here, uh, we find very strong effects of price shocks to, uh, for uh, workers who were brought in by contractors. But we don't find that for workers who came through the community channel. And that is the most interesting result of this paper. Because if you look at the response to the price shocks, it's similar for all categories of workers when the push factors are strong. So the response to the push factors are uniform across all categories, but they vary by uh, the type of recruitment for pull factors. So why are the Sardar recruitment so different from the contractor uh, recruitment? One is that the same community, when they recruit, they provide the right information. But you could argue that the Sardars also had a small network. So once they have exhausted their network, they've actually run out of people to recruit. So this is simply a, an effect of the catchment area. Um, the contractors, on the other hand, have a much larger uh, recruitment, uh, uh, a catchment area, and then they can just spread out and recruit from all, all regions. What we find is that for push factors, the, Sarda, the community recruiters of the Sardars are, are able to recruit. So it is not correct to say that the, uh, the, the catchment area for the community recruitment is actually exhausted over this period. It is the new areas which are trapped by the contractors. So if you look at recruitment by region, the green line, which is recruitment from the new areas, that is that really increases when the tea prices rise in the mid-1990s. So it is the, 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 the response that we see at the level of contractor recruitment is coming from re new regions. So how do I conclude? Oh, well, all type of types of migration responds to push factors, but only contractor recruitment responds to pull factors. Information matters in decisions to, mig uh, to migration and social networks provide the right in information. So, uh, so, so the effect of social networks on recruitment uh, is one of the, uh, one of the main uh, channels which can explain uh, what the historians and the policymakers at that time have talked about. But there's little, info, little evidence of age suppression. Um, there's, there, there's evidence that the planters gave some carrots too to the workers. There's uh, uh, allocation of plots of land to the workers uh, over time. Um, but then it comes to the broad question that if it received so much criticism at that time, why did this act continue? Um, and I think one of the reasons is that the, the act did still manage to get uh, recruitment uh, when prices, fluctuate, uh, prices rose. And lobbying the colonial state by British firms for labor laws and for product market regulation was a big part of the politics of the time. So uh, that's what, uh, it's a very, very much a political economy issue. Thank you very much, Vishnu. <laughs> and now we have the discussion by uh, Yannick Duprat. Thank you. So how, how much time do I have? Five minutes? So I will try and be short. Right, good afternoon. I will try and be short. Uh, first, thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed reading the paper. Uh, let me first say why the paper is important. It's important because uh, if we want to understand how market works, work, we need to understand the institutions on which they are based, and it's especially true for labor markets. 
there is one set of institutions uh, that we might call a free labor market. So these institutions are going to matter for the way the surplus of the labor contract is shared. And th there is a set of institutions that we can call the free labor market where the worker is, the worker is going to have uh, his or her marginal product, but this is not the only sharing role. So this is why it's important. As the paper really nicely says, most labor markets in times past have involved an element of coercion. So I wanted to say that this is particularly true for Africa, which I know best, but I'm going to skip it to focus on the paper. And this paper uh, fits into a literature studying these labor market institutions uh, in detail. Maybe I don't need to summarize the paper because you just heard Vishnu present it. Um, just what I really liked was the, the mix of methods, uh, qualitative evidence, quantitative evidence, empirical analysis, and the small tractable model. And I particularly like the qualitative evidence. You have labor reports, you have folk songs, you have memoirs of planters, and everything fits together, and it gives us a very detailed understanding of, of the way the labor markets worked in Assam. So the, there's a model making testable predictions, and these predictions are that free labor, should, free or less coercive labor should be used when the cost of migration is low and the social cost of enticement is high and indentured, indentured labor should be used when the cost of migration is high and the social cost of enticement is low. And this fits really nicely with the dichotomy between the Brahma Purtua and the Surma Valleys. And I was wondering whether you have more, so you say that in the Brahma Purtua Valleys there is a lower density of gardens and that because of that uh, the social cost of, enticem of enticement is lower, and this is a nice story, but I was wondering whether there is qualitative evidence for that, because you could think that the lower density of gardens would make it easier to entice, because you can hide in the jungle, and uh, so I was wondering whether you had qualitative evidence that it was the case. And another of the prediction of the model is that wages and migration under the special act should not react to pull factors, such as ex exogenous increase in the demand for labor. And here I think you rephrased it in the new version because was, what I was thinking is that they should react less, not, not react but react less, which is exactly what you said there. So, no. so what about the results? The way I interpret them is that you have some evidence that this is actually a contract enforcement mechanism and not a wage suppression mechanism that you talked about. Uh, about which you, you said something, but I was wondering whether your results could not also be interpreted as actually some evidence of wage suppression. First, overall, when you consider a single effect for both valleys, when you don't uh, disentangle by the type of contract, you actually find that migrations are more responsive for non-act contracts. Then you find that wages are lower for non-act labor, so it, which means that they are lower. Uh, so, so if there is no wage suppression, why are they lower? I think you need to address that, and one of explanation could be that the marginal product of labor is lower in the Brahmaputra Valley, maybe because the transport costs are higher or because of the disease environment. So maybe that would be need to have some evidence that the marginal product of labor is lower uh, in where you have non -act, uh, where you have some act uh, labor. And then the other evidence, it's, which is that migration through networks are not responsive to demand shocks. And you're saying that's because migration through network, they provide the right information. To me, that's kind of an evidence of wage suppression because if the right information is actually you're not going to get the wage they say you're going to get, I, I see that as an evidence of wage suppression. And I will conclude in the last 30 seconds by some, so this is uh, a very unfair slide because th these are suggestions. I know they are extremely demanding in terms of data. I know you probably don't have the data, but this is the good thing when you are a discussant. Just offer ideas, you don't have to worry about the data. I have a suggestion for a test, so that's very likely impossible to undertake. Could you compare the profits of the special act and the non-special act planters? No, you could not. But if you could, maybe uh, that would be a test and that would, uh, that would uh, be able, that, that, that would allow you to say whether there is wage suppression or not. And then last, uh, last question, you showed picture of contemporary workers. Can you say something about the persistence of these uh, of these labor institutions today, is it completely, uh, the, I, is the legacy completely erased or is there something that you can say about the present day?
Uh, so I was. So I was wondering if uh, it would be possible to look at specific plantations and how remote they were from the other ones to see if even in a region where a lot of the plantations were close together, there could be some that are more isolated. And do they have different recruitment practices? Is there something, you know, some difference based on the remoteness? Although, yeah. Well, it's more common out of uh, ignorance, actually. I, I was wondering whether uh, actually part of the different type of contracts could be hiding some sort of human capital within the people that they were hiring, okay? Because actually, I mean, perhaps it could well be that this worse contract actually with people with lower human, but the thing is, I don't know exactly what does it mean. So it suggested the fact that this, this kind of contracts increase when you have actually increasing price. Actually, if to extract those leaves of tea, you need lower capital because actually whatever human capital is, perhaps it's the thing that is you're really identifying is the fact that these different contracts are simply selecting different kind of people that you, perhaps in the data you cannot really see, but perhaps such evidence could tell you that, no? Yes, other remark or question? So I have a thing that uh, People are a bit tired after a long day. Uh, so I will give the floor. Yes. I was wondering about the railroads. Um, they decrease costs of moving there. So, um, and they go to sp certain places. So you, uh, I'm wondering whether you can actually um, find differences according to where the railroad went and when they went up the hills. Okay, no other question. Pranab. Uh, Vishnu, uh, the Sardar system, which is where uh, the agents recruited from the villages they know, uh, from their point of view, they must have a reputation to protect too. And whether that had an impact on the weight suppression issue and also, in general, uh, in India and also in other developing countries, um, labor is hired mainly through these recruitment agents. And if they're local, they get you more reliable labor. In, in other words, your presumption is labor is homogeneous. So, but if labor qualities vary, Sardars may be getting you quote-unquote, better labor. And that may have an effect on the wage issue. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, if I can start with that first. Uh, it is true that the labor quality, or you can sort of even think of in terms of some kind of skill capital, is, actually, is different. Um, in the qualitative discussion, you see the, that the planters want the tribal workers who migrate with families and are more stable and they come through the, the sardars, and they're more reliable. So there is, you know, there's no way we can actually, because we can't link the migration flows from the recruiting regions to the destination regions, we cannot measure these precisely. But it is true that the, that the planters prep the, the workers coming through the community channel because they find them more stable. And in that sense, the act is actually failing them because uh, you know this this is a labor does not respond to to the to the uh, pull factors. Um, the question about the distant districts, uh, we looked at the two most remote districts, uh, and we do find that desertion rates are higher there, as is the capture rate. So you find a much higher rate of uh, you know, the planters prosecuting, uh, planters and the legal system prosecuting these workers. So uh, the fact that the plantations were more uh, spread out 
did mean that the, that the social sanction didn't work as much as it did in the, in the Surma Valley, which is one of the comments uh, uh, that uh, was made earlier. So, uh, but you know, it's very difficult for us to, because we can't sort of tie the labor flows from recruitment regions to the sending regions, it's very difficult to precisely pin them down. But the qualitative literature does have that. Um, profits is impossible to find before 1911, so I don't think we can do much about that. And we don't know at the level of the firm what, what is the share of uh, act worker and the non-act worker. Um, yes, we should think in terms of wage suppression a little more, and we are trying to collect more data on this, and hopefully we'll get some different conclusions. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, very interesting uh, paper, this very interesting session. I think that we can uh, stop uh, here for today. This was a long day, nine papers in a day, plus an inaugural uh, session, so this is long. Uh, so I think that uh, we certainly uh, uh, will be, I hope we'll be rewarded for that by uh, this uh, dinner this evening. So. We meet uh, downstairs at uh, 7 o'clock uh, sharp. Even before, OK. We have to seven. So let's uh, meet downstairs at uh, uh, 5 to 7 or 10 to 7 sharp. OK, see you later. <laughs>